safety has always hit the headlines, but there's one thing being talked about more than anything else in the stone industry, and that's the threat of silicosis. I'm here in Burton-on-Trent to talk to Simon Bradbury of the Stone Industry Group. Let's go meet him. Thanks for joining us today, Simon. So it'd be great for people that don't know for you to tell me a little bit more about your business here at Stone Industry Group and what you do. Yeah, so sure. We've been uh, in business probably now 14, 15 years. Um, we've, the niche we've ended up in is water recycling and dust extraction. I have a back, long background in the industry from production through CNC equipment. I was the technical director for Breton for 10 years in the UK. And uh, we started focusing on water recycling about seven years ago and dust extraction that goes with it. And we work with Torini Claudio from Italy, which is our primary brand, these stainless steel machines. And about three years ago, we started making our own machines, which we primarily export to the US market. Given what's happening uh, in Australia and America with regards to engineered stone and restrictions being put in place, do you think that we could be seeing something similar happening at the UK at any point soon? Undoubtedly. I think uh, it's been going on for some years now. It's reached ahead, obviously, recently with Australia banning engineered stone. Um, that has triggered some major retailers to to actually ban engineered stone and the sale of its products. So IKEA started um, and Bunnings in Australia whether that will filter down to their uh, international operations is yet to be seen. I find it hard to think that it won't. So um, there's long been a push for some changes with it. Definitely it's coming. How quickly? Here, it started in Australia, now the US as well, and here will follow. The HSC I know are looking heavily at it. So... And what do you think that employers could be doing differently to protect the health of their workers from obviously silicosis and other dust related illnesses? Well, I think everybody who cuts stone, whether it be construction, whether it be countertops, whether it be hand mason, hand carved masonry, is always been at risk from the dust from stone. So depending on the material and the level that's in it, I think what's accelerated it is the availability of man-made products that have been high in silica, um, the fundamental product that makes that what it is. There's always been a need for good, safe controls, and it has always been, to say fairly lacking would be somewhat of an understatement, and the industry is not well known for um, its... Um, continual development of safety processes. It's lagged behind in a lot of ways, but I think some fabricators are starting to, to learn that they need to do something now. There's a lot that have been doing everything they need to do for some time, but that's a small proportion of the market. And what would you say to people that think that engineered stones should be banned completely? I, I fundamentally think it's the wrong decision. I think the material itself has raised our industry to a level that it would never have been without that material. What it, what it allowed was house builders, house owners, commercial projects to specify stone in a project or in a build that they ordinarily wouldn't have been able to afford because when it was quartz and marble, obviously it's more expensive, it has to be quarried. When you make a material that is man-made and then you begin to make that at scale, the price comes down, it makes it more affordable. That then lifts the industry, the development of tooling, the development of equipment, the development of handling um, items that help to move the stuff into place. That's all come along as part of engineered stone. So to just make a blanket ban of a material that can be safely worked with minimal engineering controls, I think is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction and shouldn't have been the way they went. I think California is making strides now to bring in better engineering controls, potentially licensing. I don't think that's a bad idea. I think there are a lot of companies that work out of a small railway arch type building or out of the back of a pickup or the back of a van who have no engineering controls. And that is always going to be there and you're never going to be able to legislate against those. But the bigger companies in the industry are ones that do put the money in, 
and already are putting the money in, but even those can clean up their app with simple solutions that won't cost the earth and in some cases cost nothing, just general housekeeping. So when we're talking about obviously safety procedures being put in place, um, what kind of products do you think people should be looking at investing in? Because obviously, you know, businesses are looking at how they can save money and obviously a lot of products do cost, of course they do, but what should they be looking at investing in, in your opinion? Well, primarily, everything should be worked wet. So a good water recycling system that keeps the water very clean. It doesn't have to be an expensive system. It can be whatever you need to do to keep the water clean. But if your recycled water is dirty, so if you're sending grey water back to the machines, you're effectively reintroducing into the atmosphere suspended solids and re-aspirating them. So you should really be recycling as much water as you can and keeping it as clean as possible. To work everything wet and ensure that all areas are washed down at the end of every shift, to remove any dust that's settled on the floor because that, that's a big issue for a lot of places. They'll work wet, but at the end of the day, all of that water dries on the floor and it leaves a dust residue. So the moment that they open again in the morning and the door opens and the, and the breeze blows through the building, all of that dust is back in the air again. So to work wet, to use primary extraction at the point of the work. So when you're cutting to work in front of a water wall or some other type of extraction system, and then uh, to use personal protective equipment or respiratory protective equipment. Now, likely what will happen is they will mandate, the occupational health authorities will mandate positive air pressure masks. Now, that's already happened in Australia and anybody working stone must wear positive air pressure masks. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's something that we've just got to get used to. A lot of people don't like it. There's face fit testing that has to go with that. But there are certain other types of RPE that you can wear without having a face fit test. The hooded systems, which are quite comfortable to wear. And I'm seeing now more and more companies introducing that in any areas where, where somebody's working. And then to monitor your residual air when you put all those engineering controls in place. And we've see, also seen more people now investing in floor scrubbers. So at the end of the day, somebody drives a floor scrubber around the factory, mops up all of the dust, and then that gets emptied into the water recycling system and away they go again and repeat the next day. And in terms of obviously education, because obviously that's where we could start off, you know, that yeah. kind of starting point. Um, do you think more needs to be done to actually educate people that are coming into the industry about kind of safety measures that they should be putting in in terms of for their own personal safety? Absolutely. And I think it's now a response. It's long been a responsibility of every fabricator. It is now more important than ever to ensure that all the new staff know how to cut and handle and avoid the, the risk of silica whenever they're working. There is no reason why we can't do this job in our industry safely and with minimal investment in equipment just by following the correct procedures. There are now available um, silica training courses that you can complete. The Natural Stone Institute in the US does one. They're doing one before the show in Vegas next week um, where anybody can register and go and take the course. So that it, that course is available to anybody. Um, it's It should be employed by every fabricator. It should be the first point of call for any employee that's working in the production environment in their shop. So it's, it's something that can be implemented cheaply and easily. So for a business, for example, that's thinking, you know, this will just pass, you know, people won't be talking about it anymore. Why should they be taking it seriously? And, and what, what should they be doing? Because obviously people might think, you know, this is just another thing, you know, it's health and safety and, you know, should I be taking it seriously? So what would you say to them? It's absolutely not going to go away. Uh, in the US now, we're seeing companies actively advertising for um, people to come forward and be tested so that they can make a claim on their behalf for, for potential silicosis. So that's already begun. 
it, this is all of this has been going on for many years behind closed doors. There have been a lot of lawsuits. There's been a lot of um, claims for silicosis class actions that have been happening in the US as well as Australia. So while Australia has been at the vanguard of of this ban on material. Um, the US has been been looking at it for some considerable amount of time. Government organisations tend to move very slowly, as we've seen recently with other things. Um, but now it's started to roll. And through COVID, the occupational health authorities began to talk to each other more than they've ever done before. So there's been lines of communication open that have never been there before. So now that's happened, this isn't going to just disappear. It's not any more a case of, of brushing the dust under the rug, so to speak. It is now something that everybody is having to deal with. And we are seeing now many more conversations with fabricators. What can I do? How can I do this? Do I have to spend a hundred grand on equipment? No, you don't. First of all, put these in place. And many of them don't have any dust plan at all. They don't have any any housekeeping measures in in they there's some that are still cutting dry you'll see guys in the end of the shop with a grinder just nicking the end off of backsplash and and it's it's needs to be clamped down on but it's just once they do make that jump and start to do something about it it needn't be seen as this huge it's going to cost me two hundred thousand pounds and and I, I, you know i don't know how we can't afford it you can start very simply, just just begin to make everywhere cleaner and it is not going to go away. It's Australia's happened, California has happened. California's always a little bit ahead when it comes to safety. But if if IKEA have banned the material, it, it can't be ignored. It's not it's not going to disappear. The the manufacturers now are falling over themselves to try and make material that has a limited amount or no silica in it, which has other challenges for fabricators, but they're trying to get rid of the silica in the material. But we work material that has silica in it and I've always worked material that has silica in it. Granite and quartzite, quartzite's become very popular, high silica content. So those engineering controls need to be in place irrespective of the material that you work. Do you think that people, could, you know, within the industry could collaborate more, share more learnings? Do you think that that might help? Do you think we should look at perhaps be forming a focus group? Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there needs to be an open conversation about it. For a long time, it has been the dirty subject, dust. Nobody will admit it. Everybody, you talk to them and their eyes glaze over and it's, oh, yeah, we don't have a problem with dust when, when everybody who works stone has a problem with dust, whether it be our industry, whether it be concrete, whether it be um, construction industry, mining, even even the car park outside a quarry has a massive silica problem because of the amount of the, the vehicles driving backwards and forwards and lifting the dust into the air. So we have customers that use monitoring equipment outside their building because they have so much silica in the air. So it is it is something that needs to be be kept at the forefront and to be talked about, to not be just, we don't want to talk about dust. It's 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 not something that we need to discuss. It, it is absolutely, because it is changing the industry. If engineered stone becomes a banned material, what a fabricator is going to do then? They have to switch to another material. Interestingly, the ban in Australia has left the door open, not just for engineered stone, but for other engineered materials. So that could mean porcelain. It could mean sintered surfaces. It could mean anything that contains any silica. Now, that's a dangerous precedent because they could tag onto engineered stone anything they want. Where does that leave a fabricator? It, so if they're not if they're not willing to put in the effort to ensure that the industry as a whole starts to clean up its act, if you like, then it stands to affect everybody and affect their bottom line. Because if they if they have to change it to a different material, then how are they going to combat that without it costing them more money than it would have cost them to put the practices in in the beginning? 
So would you say people shouldn't be scared of this? People should just embrace that it's an issue, accept it's an issue and do something about it? Absolutely. It's, it's, the, it's one of the easiest things you can do in our industry is to clean up what you do. It is simply a matter of changing habits. If you change p the way people are working, sure, might take a little bit longer. Might, I've heard so many times we can't cut these, these parts wet. It has to be done dry. No, it doesn't have to be done dry. It's not as easy to do it wet. The equipment is more cumbersome. Uh, it's a little bit, takes a little more getting used to, but it's like anything. Once you're used to it, it becomes habit and then it becomes easier. So it, it's absolutely, people shouldn't be frightened of it. And I think if people talk about it more, I think everybody realise, and those companies that we see that have embraced it and addressed it, I've seen a massive improvement in the working environment and definitely employees feel safer and happier and don't go home filthy, dirty, covered in white dust head to toe at the end of every day. And do you think if we can get a handle on this as an industry, we're more likely to attract talent within the industry itself? Absolutely. I mean, it's, we have a problem from the engineering side of the job. Finding technicians that are willing to work in the, what is a dirty environment. We have a, we're fortunate in manufacturing, we have quite a clean environment, but we're working with machines that come in the second hand and have, there's, there's still some, I can see some stone dust on the floor in here that is from a machine that we cleaned up and, set and refurbished and sent out. Engineers don't want to work in the environment. It's wet, it's dirty, it's cold, it's cold in here today. So it is, it's it's a segment that the, that you can't get people to work in. The same is true from fabricators getting people to come and hand polish, and they don't want to work in that environment. But if you give them an environment that's cleaner, that's that they feel safer, then surely you're going to attract more attract more people into it. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I've learned a lot and I'm sure that people watching this will. And I'm really excited to hear that things can be more positive and that hopefully we can attract new people into the industry. Thank you.